Hi, this is Tolik for the Andromeda Council. Today is Wednesday, June 6th, 2018. I am here and honored to welcome and share with you today Athena of Soul Song Whisperer. She uses the high vibrational frequency of her voice and years of study to help people heal themselves. Athena lives in the greater Sedona area, and I hope you enjoy listening to all of her experiences as she reaches out in her world to help others. Athena, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Hello. Glad to be here. Uh, it's, it's good to have you here. Um, you know, over the course of years, as I've done this work, uh, it's been a real blessing to meet a lot of really gifted and talented women, and I count you among them. So thanks, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you moved here recently, uh, coming from uh, California most recently, but living most of your life in the Phoenix area. Without giving a complete history of who you are, who you are, and what you're all about, maybe a good place to start is to share with the people listening, kind of like what that pivotal event was early in your life that told you you had some special gifts that you could tap into that maybe other people never saw or understood but you knew that you could use them to help people's lives for the better uh, yes one of the things that happened to me was uh, being able to be visited by my friends from Pleiades, Lyra they came because I was a very lonely child, and I parents would leave us alone, yeah. having no one there, and uh, I was responsible for a, a brother at age seven. So they did come and visit me. Now I didn't remember that till it was about forty. So I'd have to say the one experience that was vis was. A memory then was when I was seven and I remember being on my knees and saying what is my mission what am I supposed to do and which was kind of young but I think it was triggered by um, a lot of religious training that we had that was really good and feeling like I didn't fit in I didn't feel like this was my home yeah I've, I've heard this theme from a lot of really gifted women where they've never quite felt part of this this 3D human consciousness, simply because your own natural gifts and abilities reach beyond the 3D consciousness, beyond the 3D realm. What um, do you remember? What the event was at around age 40 that triggered this awakening? Triggered triggered the memory of this experience when you were seven. Um. Yes, when I went uh, to University of Life Church, it was a church in Phoenix where they had um, a lot of channeling classes. You learned to channel, they meditated, and so on, way before it was cool. No one, not many people actually even meditated then. Okay. And Kevin Ryerson had a class there before he ended up going to California. Um, and John the Revelator who came through Kevin told me, kind of triggered the memory for me. And then just a lot of um, psychic experiences, experiences in my childhood uh, that I just came in with. I mean, knowings that there's no way I could have known because my family was Southern Baptist. And um, because of that trigger, I remembered all kinds of experiences uh, and having a very thin veil so I kind of knew when I came in a lot of things that it, it, it was like you could not share anything with your family anybody because at that time that was in the 50s you weren't allowed to say anything or they'd say oh that's imaginary that's your imaginary friends oh that's yeah. you know you're crazy a lot of people were locked up <laughs> crazy because that happened to them and they try to tell their parents but so. I'm, I'm curious uh, when Kevin Ryerson mm -hmm. um, opened up and 
shared what he sensed about you, when those memories of yours started to come back, was it sort of like he threw a switch and these memories start started to flood in? Or th were they more, you know, you get like three or four memories and then another five or six? Or did, did they, like opening the floodgates and they came um, flooding in? I think out? all that came back right then was, was as a child. Um, at 18, I had already started doing readings and, and uh, studying yoga. Where, I don't remember, except that I was an avid reader, I don't really remember how I learned any of those things. I think I just came in with it. That, okay. That physical exercise was important. My dad did exercise and teach us that, those things. But I wanted underwater birth for my children and all kinds of things that were way beyond what an average person would even think of. And um, it was just, um, I remember at, at that time when John the Revelator through Kevin came in when he was channeling, um, he had told me how I had stood up in uh, Sunday school and argued with the teacher about what Jesus was really like. And I was, bet that was a story. <laughs> <laughs> she thought I was a kid from the hell, I guess, because they believed in hell and heaven and, and told my parent, my, my father, my grandfather. So, of course, I got punished. But I told her, I said, no, he came here just because he wanted to spread love. And that's the idea. We don't believe in theology. And I went on and on and on. <laughs> and I must have been a real pain. So Another situation where a young a female, in this case a young female child, um, speaks the truth without coming through the church. <laughs> and a lot of people, you know, you go back to what the... the I guess what we call the Dark Ages, you know, with the Inquis the Spanish Inquisition, and then when mm -hmm. the people came over from Europe and started to found this country, and then they started to burn witches at the stake, all because women would speak as a pure channel mm -hmm. to God, the Creator, uh, the heavens, the higher dimensions. And you said your your upbringing was Southern Baptist. Uh, yeah, yes. Not good. <laughs> yeah, so if you. If you do say something like that, you automatically thought of as showing off, trying yeah. to get attention. And so from then on, for a long time, I kept quiet. Well, until I was about, well, I actually did until I was about 30 before I said much. Okay. Um, I did take lessons at SRF from about, with Yogananda. Yogananda. So what, is, what is SRF? Uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. Ah, okay. Yeah. So there were lessons from Yogananda's uh, teachings. So I did do that. Um, chose to usher a certain spirit into the body. And mind you, that was still... That was still the 70s. And so... That's, that is early. Considered, yeah. Considering where we're at today and what people are speaking openly about now you know as i'm sure people who are listening are aware there are certain spiritual centers in this country like sedona and tucson and Asheville, north carolina and maybe a couple others but so we uh, we do happen to be in a, the greater sedona area where people are speaking speaking openly about this topic and so you're in arizona in the greater Phoenix area in the 70s speaking openly about this. And Phoenix is pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. it, it was at that time. It, it's better. There was an ESP society and uh, air seminars and a certain... Oh, yeah. And EST. EST was and around. A yeah. few things like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, Ekankar was right. around. And, um, but we, we were still thought of as quite unusual people. And... Uh, but... One lesson I know that light workers, whatever you want to call them, star seeds, we need to learn discernment in who to speak to and who not to speak to, what to say and what not to say. Because as we share, we're not always enlightening people. Sometimes we can close them off from truth okay. when, because they rebel because we say too much. When you say who to talk to and who not to talk to, are you talking about 
who in the higher dimensions no. that each person should be communicating with? No, or? who on earth, like in our surroundings, our family. Okay. Uh, I did ah, not have discernment. Good, I did not have good discernment. Got it. And now I understand. Okay. Yeah. There were people that I said too much to. I had to learn the hard way. They weren't ready. And so then you tell them too much. And, you know, it was a, it's a journey in learning yeah. um, to listen. So I had to learn to listen to my guidance. Now I always check in with my higher self and should I reveal this or not? If I know something about someone, because it can just as well throw them off their path. Right, right, that's right. May not help them at all, it may hurt them. Well, there, there's so. a, a saying that's been around, I don't know how long, but I'll paraphrase. The, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Mm -hmm. So that's the saying. But from what I've learned from my own learning process over the course of the past 20 years, one of the inviolate spiritual laws is unless someone is ready, even if you th see things going on with them, we each of us need to keep our mouths closed mm -hmm. and our knowledge to ourselves until that person is ready. Right. And once once they start asking questions, if they continue to ask questions, you can continue to speak mm -hmm. and, and share what you know. Right. Sometimes by just revealing what you go through, they may ask. But um, yeah. there are many, many people to help each person. Good point. So I had to learn. I wasn't the only one. I wasn't here to save everybody in the world. And uh, if I'm guided, then that person will happen to... Um, uh, be taught by my example or my story or something they see. Um, not everybody can reach each person that needs to know something. You know, right. There's different teachers the, for different students. Right, and, right, and different modalities mm -hmm. of revealing information, different modalities of healing, of right. course. They're all each of them are appropriate depending on where a person is at in terms of his or her own her own growth, awakening. Right. So um, we were talking about some of the different experiences that you've had. Would you share with me and share with everyone else, what was sort of the first major life experience that you had where you were, you felt like you're really able to help someone when they really needed it the most? And right now we're talking about early in your life experiences when, when you were doing this kind of thing. Um, well, I, at 18, I used to, uh, my friends would give me a photograph of their boyfriends. And, and when they found out that I could do handwriting analysis, well, when I started doing handwriting analysis, it quickly turned into mediumship. And I didn't realize it was happening at first. And then... It got so easy to totally describe the person that the girl was going with. Based on the photo. Based on the photo. Okay. I would tap in just records, cash records, and I didn't realize that I I didn't realize any names for anything. It just was this little window I would go to and I didn't even know I was doing it. And but I had to call it handwriting analysis because at that time it wouldn't have been accepted if I said I was a medium. They didn't even know what that was. It was in Texas. With, with, oh. with going to school, business college, uh, while I was staying with my mother. So you're in the Bible Belt South. Yes. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. So I did. It was real accurate, and so that made me. That spurred me on to start reading. So yeah. I started, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And so I just started reading about everything I could. Um, probably every book I read and read and read for years, um, and expanding no, so that I could. Be prepared because I knew what I needed to do. Then it started coming. Okay. Um, and and I would imagine that, and you know, we've had enough conversations. You were a, a pretty adept communicator. You probably wanted to have a database, if you will, of references of some kind of vocabulary yeah. to kind of put around what you were doing and what, mm -hmm. what uh, gifts you were sharing with people. Uh, right. yeah. I would imagine that would be helpful. Yeah. Otherwise, you have no foundation. You don't even know right. what you're doing. And uh, I got a psychic encyclopedia and all kinds of things to help me understand 
uh, and we had no internet, so we couldn't really look things up on the internet. Right. right. Um, so it was go to the library. I would skip school in high school and go to the library <laughs> instead of uh -huh. going out to drink beer like a lot of the kids were even then. Um, but I think the even then I married a Mormon, uh, so I had to keep it pretty quiet uh, during those ten years and. I think the most prevalent thing that happened to me when I felt really good about who I was was when I started just happening on accidents when people were dying. And the one thing that hit me and made me look at my authentic self, who I really was, stop hiding what I was doing okay. as much as I would. If you get punished for something, something you usually hide, or people I've known have hidden because they don't want to be punished. And uh, I was in Mesa, and it was raining, and this doctor's son and his fiance were going to be married that weekend. Is this the later. is this the accident that, story that you shared with me? Yeah, yes. this is a pretty this is a pr actually a pretty profound story. So you know, it was it was amazing, and I still think about it sometimes and go, that was just so rewarding. Yeah. Uh, this, I think the gentleman was maybe 23, and they were in a little sports car, and he had been driving too fast. I don't know what they were doing while they were driving, because they drove under a big truck where her whole body got shaved, so she was full of blood. And I always thought, gosh, that's going to scare me if I see blood all over. Because yeah. I'd never really seen it, so it didn't bother me a bit. So you arrived, like, right after the accident as happened? As soon after it as it happened. It was raining um, for about half an hour. Nobody, uh, no after, ambulance came afternoon, after the accident. Afternoon, evening? Um, early evening. So it was somewhat dark? Yeah, it was dusk. Okay. And... Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, street roads or uh, oh, on, on, a, on, a street, on a highway, in a, so street roads. In a neighborhood, oh, so boy. it wasn't really that visual, and people were in their houses. People weren't really watching. Okay. Um, I had to make a quick decision. Do I call 911 real fast, or do I help this person? Well, what I was told, was guided uh, by my by herself, was to help him pass over. So I knew he was going to die. You knew he, yeah, you knew yeah. he was going to leave. He had broken his neck and his uh, had hit the chest steering column. Okay. You know, and hit his chest and his neck was back. His head was back. He was gasping for air, and so I put my hand on his arm, which he right away I know mentally he knew I was there. Okay. And there was this telepathic communication, uh, and uh, I was probably standing there. 10 minutes, just meditating, pray, you know, just doing a little prayer for him and, and meditate, just standing there. A gentleman came up, I don't know where he came from, because there wasn't a car, and said, is there anything I can do to help? And so I just, right away, I was just in action mode, and I just said, put your hand on my shoulder and help me give him healing, please. Okay. He just came out of the blue, didn't know this guy. But he did, and I could just feel it rushing through stronger. This, this energy yeah. from this, the show. So we were, we were helping this person pass over. And she was beyond help, you know, she, we knew she was, she was gone. Uh, the police arrived, and it was so strange because I really don't think they saw us because they left us there, never came and checked on this couple for at least 10 minutes. Um, they were working, they were up in the truck helping get the uh, driver out. So a, a couple questions, if you don't mind. When the accident happened, since this truck sheared off the upper half of this small sports car, was it a convertible they were in? Yes. It was convertible, oh boy, okay. Um, Had a cloth top. Yeah, all right. So then the, the shearing off obviously mm -hmm. happened really easy. Mm -hmm. When the accident happened, had they been traveling, like on a, on a multi-lane, major road and then this guy was able to pull into a neighborhood but because he must have been the truck must have been going at a pretty fast speed to do this to these people in this you car know, i never thought about that i don't really know i know there was two lanes 
where they were. And yeah. It was in the middle of a neighborhood. So I don't think. I don't. I really don't no. know. To okay. This day. I don't right. know if um, if they had driven a little ways. I don't think so. I think that it happened right there, and I think that the sports car rolled back a little. They were real close to the truck, but I think okay. it rolled back. And uh, once he didn't have his foot on the brake or anything. Um, I didn't think to put it in park or anything. It didn't go anywhere. It was level, evidently. So the the car that these people, these two people mm -hmm. were in, was in a level street and it mm -hmm. wasn't rolling anywhere. Yeah. yeah and so right. you and this gentleman were essentially giving this man as much healing energy, I would imagine, in terms of helping him to feel comfortable and safe during um, during these last few moments. I know the knowing within me was that I am a person that in many lifetimes helped people transmute their pain. Okay. Helped them transmute the pain so they didn't feel pain when they were dying. And so I knew that's what I was doing. Okay. I didn't mentally go, I'm going to transmute. Uh, right, it. right. It's but just sending the energy and good. with this gentleman and he actually died without a lot of pain. How I know that, once the policeman came and we left, I think we were invisible. They didn't even acknowledge us or anything. That's incredible. I, I think the, the gentleman that came up to me was an angel. Not People say angel. Okay. Was an entity from somewhere else, <laughs> from another dimension. Because I think he helped me be, be invisible or the car or something. I, I just haven't really figured it out since then. No. But when I left and they came up and did what they could do, I knew he had, he had died, and I went to my girlfriend's house. I was supposed to go there and give her a reading afterwards because her dad had passed, a uh, reading from her dad. And uh, I went into her house. It was dark. She'd given me the key, and right away I heard, I felt arms around me. It was dark. There was no arms. They were okay. I was going to ask you dimension. if you felt some kind of interaction with him yeah, he, after the he event. He put his arms around me. He he was holding me on the right side of my body, and he said, and I could hear the sound like he was really talking clear audiently. I heard, "Sure, thank you so much for helping me. I wish I could have known you in life." Oh. And then he went on, and I just cried. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I not just, surprised, especially since. The whole awareness of what I just went through was still trying to process on my way over to her house. And it was an amazing weekend. And then, of course, I proceeded the next day to give her uh, a reading about her dad, and that was really productive. Um, told her all, he told me what to say to her. Okay. Um, and you were in your late 20s or 30s your 30s back then mid 30s mid 30s okay yeah um that's an incredible that was the first time that i Could was I... tuned in to think hey i have this that i need i want to help people and i can it. help it was so incredibly joyful it, it gave me so much joy to be able to help that i knew that was part of my mission was, yeah. you know, we all have many faceted missions. I'm sure we all have many things that we came to do. But it was, uh, it still stands out in my head. Is I, I've, now I've been to other accidents and said, go to the light and help right. people. You know, there's, this was the most profound. And I saw it in the paper the next day. This doctor, I could say their name. I saw the name and so and so and his girlfriend were going to, supposed to be married this weekend, you know, in the obituaries wow. and stuff. And I always wanted to call them and say, I, I knew your son in death, and I hope that he didn't have any pain when he died. I couldn't. Yeah. There's no way they would they, understand. They wouldn't understand. Especially at that yeah. time. They might now. Yeah. Um, it was a Mormon family. And uh, they're wonderful people, and they, they're, they very much understand a lot of the, these things. But at that time, it was not as much. Sure. sure. So... Um, yeah, it was a very joyful experience. How how about um, you know? The, 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 <laughs> there's so much in that one experience that this couple experienced, and and that 
it doesn't sound like you interacted with her, but certainly you helped yeah, him. Gone. You helped him re release and probably feel no pain through that process of leaving. So that's a significant experience for you. Um, you know, take us forward like maybe 10 or 15 years into the future and maybe a, a completely different kind of event that utilize your um, gifts and skills, but just in a completely different way. Well, I was, um, when I was in Payson, my daughter was eight, and I lived in Payson, Arizona for a while, and um, there, I, I'd already known that, that uh, years before I'd had a reading that I could do harmonic healing, and that I was capable of mending bones and so on. And so one time when my daughter's um, finger got crushed in the car door, and we heard the bones go, eh, 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 you know, I'm great. Because oh <laughs> a tiny kid has tiny little fingers, and, you know. And all those nerve endings in the human hand and fingers, right. I mean, thousands and of them. Mind you, I'd raised her as a knowing these things. I had raised her meditating and so on. So she's a very open-minded child. That's probably one reason she got teased a little bit. I had to teach her what not to say. Ah, okay. <laughs> Don't just say yeah, yeah, right. it like I did. Right. <laughs> and make people think you're crazy. Be on but how do you teach a child to be honest and not honest? <laughs> Sometimes very tricky. Yeah. Um, did you use expressions like, people might not quite understand these concepts. I mean, those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, but it was it was still very hard. She because she was a very open child. Child, yeah. and um, yeah, it was very hard. And we've discussed it many times. So she crushes her finger in, in this car door. Mm -hmm. My car door, and right. get out, and right away, I just said, uh, visualize it totally well. And I took her finger and held on to it, and and we just did cues. We just went. You, oh yeah, Ekin Carr. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I held her finger for two or three minutes and she was a very tuned in child. She could have rejected all of my teaching, but she uh, embraced it. She was okay. you know, very evolved child. And after about three minutes, I opened my hand and there wasn't a black and blue mark. There was nothing. It was totally healed. So from then on, I went, okay, anybody can do this. You know, huh. everybody just has to believe they can. No black and blue on the finger. Nothing. It never got black and blue. She didn't lose her fingernail. Nothing. That's amazing. So it, mind you, it wasn't squished. Right. But we know for sure there were a couple broken there bones. Were, yeah, there were breaks. Because we heard them. <laughs> Crunch. And yeah. that could stick in your mind, and then you wouldn't be able to. You had to yeah. embrace that. And... So she, she went with you on this journey and said, Okay, Mom, we're, you're going to heal my hand. Yeah. yeah, she had faith. Wow. Yeah, yeah it, was, um, it was. That was a good experience. Um, since then, right after that, my 30s and 40s, I know that I. Uh, there was a, a man in that town who had cataracts, and. I had uh, I was working at a healing type place where we do colonics and massage and all kinds of things anyway in Payson, Arizona. And a guy came in who had cataracts and I got to know him and going to a meeting one night, well, afternoon about four o'clock, I just offered and said, Well, what if you could let them go? What if you let your cataracts go? What if, do you have faith that God can heal? Because he was a very Christian man, so okay. of course, you don't use, that. use any metaphysical, what they used to call metaphysical <laughs> references, phrases yes. or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because mm -hmm. there were people like Catherine Kuhlman and people who would do laying on of hands healing and you know that kind of thing, you have to really use the right language with people. And um, put my hands over his eyes, and of course, it depends on the person's faith. He was, he had a lot of faith and he just okay let's try it and so I did that it was about a minute and we were breathing and just visualizing and, and um, next day he got his eyes checked and the cataracts were gone 
So I've had many experiences like wow. that. So yeah. as you were, as you had your hands on his eyes, mm-hmm. he was I'm trying to wrap my my uh, knowledge of this experience and using contemporary terms. He uh, at least in using terms that apply to what he was feeling, what he was thinking. Are you saying that he trusted you enough in that you were bringing, bringing through yourself you know, God's healing energy, the Creator's healing energy? Was that right, essentially because what... I don't believe we heal anybody. Okay. I don't take credit. It's like people say, God did it. Well, I actually know within myself that it depends on the person themselves, how much faith they have, and they heal themselves. My favorite saying is, hold your light high enough to help others see their own light. Hmm. Because that's all, we're, all we do, is we facilitate other people healing themselves by raising the vibration, by giving them hope. <clears throat> you so, give them a glimmer of hope and they can, that they can, and, and knowing that they can do it, and they will. So them believing that it's possible mm-hmm. that there's a realistic chance that, parenthetically, the work that you can do on the, the bringing forward the Creator, God's energy, through you. Right. Them believing it as well is a key, a key to the healing process. Right. I think that's the whole... I believe that's the whole thing. Yes, there's a gift in, in enlightening people to be their authentic self. There is a gift in inspiring people to raise their vibration. All those, it's like motivational speakers can make people feel amazingly positive. True. So if you are a person that can help people believe that there's hope, um, that's all it is. Good point. Yeah. You know, to me, that's what, where the secret is. Of course, I've healed my own, um, I had detached retina on both eyes from falling. Um, I was carrying big, heavy movie sets, and I fell two different times. I healed those, and went back, they were gone. And then I uh, had meningitis, spinal meningitis. And, well, God healed that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I actually believe that if I meditated through the whole thing, Mm-hmm. and kept my vibration high, the meningitis would have to go. It was well as a cataract, so I didn't allow any doubt in. Of course, at that time, there was the DVD, The Secret, came oh, out, sure. and all these things, and it helps to yep. realize that there's a woman on there who had cancer, and she watched uh, inspiring movies and all that stuff. Sure, it changed her lifestyle a little, but mainly she kept her vibration high, and her cancer went away, and she was on... As part of the secret message. Okay, sure. And um, so that did help a lot of people have a little more faith that they didn't have to use a medication. I never used any medication. I used garlic and green drinks and lots of water. And um, but I think the main thing was the belief. Was the thoughts and feelings of a person create healing or disease? Um, and people will say. No, I didn't create this disease. I wouldn't do this to myself. But I really believe that out of default or lack of knowing or, you know, anger, whatever, lifestyle, there's a lot of reasons why people get diseases. And I at the time was doing too much and um, I had let my lifestyle get too, uh, too busy, not enough rest and so on and so forth. Well, welcome to the so, human condition. Yeah. And you were raising children at the time. I was raising time. children yeah. at the same time, so you didn't get much sleep. Um, and I've had pneumonia three times, and I have conquered that too. But I, because I, I think a lot of it is because I was raised by a father who, he, number one, he exercised. He wasn't that positive thinker. But he always did believe that people could do what they think they could, think they can. There were a few things that he was really tuned into. And um, I think we pick our parents. Mm. 
So I picked the right parents. My mother was very loving. My grandmother was very loving. Uh, strict but loving. And uh, I think we have to give a little credit to um, ourselves be ourselves before we get here <laughs> for yeah. picking people that yeah. uh, could send us the way we need to go to uh, fulfill our destiny, whatever we want to do here. And um, so these experiences were just to me, okay, there's another one. <laughs> right. Like, there's another one, there's another one, because after a while I was like, okay. Tomorrow, what's going to happen that's really fun? I can help someone. So yeah. I just, you know, it got to be kind of a fun game. And I knew the synchronicity would just catch in. Okay. There's, uh, there's a gentleman who's a friend of yours, and you've told me this story. I think his name is Ron or Ronald. Mm -hmm. And he had a, a lifestyle that contributed to a body that was way out of condition and... and he really needed some fixing up, so to speak. Um, why don't you, that's a great story because he had a serious condition. He had diabetes. Yeah, type two diabetes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not to uh, slam in the D's, they're doing what they need to do and what they believe. But he had tried that route and it wasn't doing any good. He was getting, um, so he couldn't feel his feet and he was uh, losing his eyesight. Wow. He was like 60, or something. I don't remember exactly how old he was. He's a friend of mine still. We, we still email occasionally. Um, I got the knowing that he would be, he is a great person to um, be here. He wanted to stay here longer. He didn't know how to change his lifestyle and what to do. Okay. And he was kind of the visual person that needs to see somebody do it or needs to be shown how to do things. He didn't know sure. how to cook. He didn't know how to... So I said, okay, I've got a few extra months. I'll come up to Utah and, and, and help you. And I'd never done that before. So you, he was, he was, this gentleman was living in Utah at Living the time. in Salt Lake City. Okay, all right. right. And, and just as a reference point, this story that you're telling doesn't, doesn't necessarily leverage your higher dimensional telecommunications, you know, telepathy kind of spiritual uh, gifts. Well, it does because... I meditated. Okay. Um, he has a testimony on my website. I meditated um, asking because, you know, what lifestyle changes in, to individualize his healing program. Okay. Through, I learned it through meditation with his higher self, connected with his higher self and mine. And because every person who has an ailment is different. You can't just... Okay, this is how you get over diabetes. Okay, this is how you get over ca cancer. Every single person, in my uh, opinion, it needs to be a little different according to what their, I don't know, right. allergies or whatever, right. or likes and, get, and dislikes. Right. And, and or, as, as a lot of us are learning these days, past life experiences. Right, that's true too. Traumas that have, may have happened in past lives mm -hmm. that are residual in what we might call the etheric body. Mm -hmm. that we bring forward and forward again and forward again and all these new lives. Right. And so right. who knows what he's got collectively inside of his etheric that needs to be cleaned up. Right. Well, he's cleared up pretty darn fast because okay. I don't think he had, I knew, I knew he'd been a scene, in a scene uh, years, you know, way back in a past life and he hmm. had learned a lot of keeping a healthy body. So somewhere in the, in the background, he did know these things. He was like, it was just reminders. Okay. It right. wasn't this lifetime that he knew. He hadn't studied it, but I think the reminders, it made him trigger what he knew before. And I think he'd been a doctor in past lives and an herbalist and all kinds of things. Uh, okay. So when I got there, um, he was amazed that I even went there, you know, and, and he was very, very appreciative. I just right away just meditated and um, I ended up being there three months, I think. I did change his lifestyle a little, help him with changing it because he would once a day eat nachos <laughs> and drink soda and stuff. One meal. That's it. So obviously he wasn't getting the minerals and vitamins he needed. There wasn't enough in that one meal. So let me guess, nachos and all of that fake gooey cheese? Mm -hmm. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it might have been plastic for all I know because it depends on where you buy it, what restaurants you go to. 
That was his meal? That was his that was his whole meal. Okay. He'd drink water, but really not enough. He drank tea and energy drinks and, and there really was a lot of sugar and cheese and Jeez. So, well anything from that would have been an improvement. But, but yeah, keep anything, going. That's, yeah. that's true. That's true. Anything yeah. would be all right. But, that's that's a pretty tough baseline to start from, but, yeah. but go ahead. <laughs> he was dehydrated, so his blood sugar was like two hundred. And let me guess. Two hundred twenty. Pro probably overweight. Way overweight. Okay. Yeah, he ended up. And let me guess like again. Pounds. No exercise at all. Uh, very little. Okay. He'd walk once in a while, but usually just sitting at the computer. Yeah. And um, such a kind, nice person. I was so glad that I could help him. Um, so I just that's pretty much it. Just kind of steer his diet toward him gradually, not things that he didn't like. Find out what he didn't like, what he did like, and my higher self was more toward what he was thinking, helping with his thinking processes. Um, it was mainly like giving him hope, you know, because type 2 diabetes, in my estimation, doesn't exist um, in the way that people think of it. Okay. That's all I'll say. All right. Because I really believe that uh, herbs and so on, things like that, can trigger and not have side effects. It's a much more gentle way to not have a blood sugar problem. Um, that we get shocked with medication sometimes. That doesn't mean they don't serve a purpose at times. Um, so anyway, he, I made food. I actually prepared the food for him. I don't do this anymore. I don't go out to people's homes and do all the work for them. Okay. But I did it for a couple of weeks and then showed him how so he could take over. Because he didn't know how to cook. I mean, he was like, I don't know what to do, you know. <laughs> He, yeah. He'd never been taught to cook. Really. In this case, there was a real value to you being the teacher, you know, mm -hmm. teach the person to take care of themselves. At the same time, empower him and not make him feel like he's less than. And so I think yeah. that's part of my gift is to help people feel empowered that just because I have some training they don't have, he had a lot of training I didn't have. I learned a lot from that man. So. <laughs> just in science, just a lot of things he knew. He knew business and all kinds of stuff. But I just had happened to have an area that he didn't know about and he needed it. So within, to make a long story short, within two months, he came down from 220 blood sugar to like 120. Wow. And uh, I didn't tell him to, but all of a sudden he just said, I'm not taking insulin anymore because he was on insulin. Okay. And he, I said, well, that's up to you because I don't want to take people's medication away. You know, that's right. their decision. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a wise choice. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm not an MD, but he stopped him. He kept his diet up, no problem. Because I think, well, he figured that if he kept taking the insulin, it, his blood sugar would get too low. Because he was hmm. already lowering it naturally. Now, I, and there were herbs, okay, herb, herbal teas, and so on, and cleansing his body out, and detoxing, and yeah. removing candida, and you know, this kind of thing, probiotics, and um, omega three, six, and nines, that kind of thing, to balance out the body, and plenty of minerals. Um, so, um, yeah, I was there three months to make sure he was okay, and then and then I left. But by but. By two months, he was pretty much well. He went to the gym, hmm. taught him to exercise, you know, every major meal to exercise afterwards. And it's uh, it's like Julian Whitaker is on, is on YouTube, and he teaches people. That's how I learned a lot of this stuff. Was I read his book uh, about you can how to reverse diabetes, and that was in the eighties. Wow. They wrote that book. He's now on YouTube, and the man is eighty something. Wow. And he's been doing this. He's an MD, uh, holistic. He knows both sides of it. Hmm. Okay. And, um, so I helped a lot of people with this book at first. And then I started just meditating and, you know, tailoring it for each person after having that knowledge. Um, and I mean, that man's amazing. I've never met him, but someday I'd like to meet him. He's an amazing doctor to stand up and do what he thinks is right no matter how much bashing he's gotten from the other people in his uh, profession. so Because he's, he's revealing information that 
is not uh, prototypical with how yeah how the MD world works and mainstream medicine. Yeah, and it's better now. It's better now because there's another man who has a book like that too. Now this there's a lot of books like that now. At the time, it took courage for him to stand up. Yeah, and and it, it certainly happened in early in the two, at least in the early 2000s, where people started to take responsibility right. for the health of their lives, for the health of their body, their mind, their spirit, right. their heart. And most people had a sugar addiction. Most people do now. Yeah. It, it, if they got off sugar for two, two weeks, even a week sometimes, they get tremors like it's a drug. They just get the shakes. Wow. It's like the old book, uh, Sugar Blues. It was written in the 70s, I think. And it, it just lays out the whole thing. You know, X amount of sugar is good, but then over that, you're going to get addicted to it. It's a drug. Mm. So uh, even honey, whatever it is, it, although it's much better for your body. But the main thing with me is not the diet. Okay. That was get, getting a diet simple enough so his body would not have heavy digestion to do, you know, all the work to do. Mm. It wasn't a matter of the diet. I'm sure you can get well and not change your diet if your if your mind is strong enough. But you might as well make it easier. Right, of course. You know, and make it like the Japanese. Japanese don't have half the diseases we do because they focus everything around fruits and vegetables and they exercise. And and they, it's just and part they... of their lifestyle. You get up in the morning, you exercise. Midday, you exercise. Hmm. You do calisthenics. If anybody studies their lifestyle they're slim the women don't get heavy nobody gets really heavy except a, 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 a wrestler right. you know that and traditionally they're not eating a lot of carbohydrates mm-hmm. either I mean. no the little rice uh, mainly I mean there's, yeah. sure there's people who get away from it but, but yeah basically rice it's rice, rice and noodles vegetables and yeah. a little rice yeah. and, uh, yeah. uh, the, and their whole thought process is yes I can stay healthy because that's how they're raised right so a lot of it, to me, most of it is mental, like the secret tells you most of it is uh, the law of attraction. You know, you make your own reality according to your feelings and thoughts, yeah. and uh, which is a good thing to study too, I think. But it's all. Um, I suppose we can come in with a having to have a disease to get over a certain something we want to get over this lifetime or some kind of lesson that we want to teach others through having a disease. I'm sure there are uh, lives that people choose like that. Um, They want to teach their parents a lesson by having to deal with whatever that the disease the child has. I'm sure there are exceptions um, to the rule of, oh, you caused it by your thoughts and your, your anger and your Right, of course. You know, resentment and whatever. Um, I don't claim to know everybody's situation. I'm sure there are occasions where it isn't just uh, them creating it out of anger or anything. So, um, but most of the time, I think that that if we become happy people first and believe first before we see it, then I think that. There's anything a lot can be to cleared that. up. Yeah. Anything's anything can be healed. It's yeah. my it's my belief system. So I know that you recently you've recently formalized this work that you're doing into a practice now that you're living up here in the greater Sedona area. And people can read about the services that you provide on your website called soulsongwhisperer.com. Can you can you address some of the, if you will, the gifts and the modalities that you're really excited about using today through this new practice that that you you're formally sharing with the public up here in the greater Sedona area called Soul Song Whisperer? What are some of the things that you'd like to do that some of the some of the people that you'd like to help? Um Mainly, it's uh, the the singing, uh, the harmonic healing, because people can be 
depressed, they can be um, discouraged with their lives, or they can have an ailment. Right. And to me, there's I believe there's celestial music out in the out in the cosmos, and I believe that most um, most I shouldn't say most. A lot of people have heard this this music. A lot sure. Of yes. Yes. Are aware uh, that I think the whole the universe is just it's like the movement of the planets they say makes music. Mm -hmm. I really feel like that music is innate to healing for each human being and that every person has their own note, their own tones that can trigger their healing. Right. And, and just as a reference point for people listening, for people who don't know Athena, uh, you've always loved to sing. You, I, I, I've seen the smile on your face. You know, you kind of light up when you do sing. You take great joy and pleasure in singing. So now you're formally going to use this joy and this, this gift that you have of singing to help people heal themselves in the very, very similar to the other ways that you've helped people to heal themselves. Um, what, what will some of those things look like? How do you think that you'll, you'll be helping people in terms of how do you think you're going to do this? Well, I'll just, cre I create, um, create music for them, you know, and they, uh, no matter what the ailment is or the situation in their lives, this music, uh, similar to when you hear somebody sing and you get goosebumps. Ah, okay, there sure. A lot of people. Yeah. Grow it into many, many women and, and you know, all kinds of people. I, people get goosebumps when, whenever, listening to them. There are two, three songs that Whitney Houston has sung in her life. And now Glennis Grace, who's, if you will, a a study of Whitney Houston, amazing voice mm -hmm. from this woman from the Netherlands has. And even speaking about this, I'm getting chills. Mm -hmm. When I hear these two or three songs, including Run to You mm -hmm. and a couple of others, I always get these chills throughout my body because there are certain notes and certain frequencies that are hit. And there's a certain, if you will, heart, deep heartfelt emotion that's being brought forward. And it's incredible to use these human ears and to take in those frequencies and feel the cause and effect. So if I'm saying this right, you do a similar thing when, when you encounter a person, a particular new client, that you'll compose a song for them or is it, will it be a, a, a chanting or a... Uh, each one will be different. Okay. And, and I think a lot of it is what kind of music does the person like? Ah. So I don't, I know that it's different each time. Okay. And when you truly channel, you take information from their higher self. Um, I don't think about it, it just happens, but I know that that's what's happening. And so their guides and higher self, whatever, know what's going to exactly appeal to them. Sure. If someone hates rap, and you do a healing song with rap, they're not it's going not gonna to help anybody. No, yeah. They're not uh, going to heal. Sure. I mean, that's just, it has to be geared to that person. And sure. I, when I do this, it's, um, it's not a conscious uh, well, channeling. I, I'm a conscious channel, but it has to be, I have to let go of any results that I think I want and be a neutral because whatever results there are is because of what that person needs. Right. It's not about me. It's not about do I sound good? I mean, I find myself as a human being sometimes thinking those thoughts, but, it, but I know in my heart that I have to bypass that yeah. and go, this is about them. This is about what they need. And you have to be willing to set your ego aside. That's uh, and also, there's there's sometimes people need more than that. They might need a lifestyle change, or they might ask for that. If they ask, it might be a combination of things that will help them heal. Okay. So on my website, it tells the various things. Right. Yeah, and I see that you've provided 
different options and different levels that, that you can take them to address whatever they're concerned with in terms mm -hmm. of making positive changes in their lives. Um, I know we're getting toward the end, but before okay. before we go, uh, this is this is actually a really I think a really neat time to introduce this. Um, you actually have something that a lot of people don't have, which is kind of neat. Um, there was a movie produced recently, and you sang a song that has been credited in that movie. And it's, was it uh, an indie? Was it released independently? An independent film. Independent film. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you still have a song that you sang that was played in this movie. Can you can you t share with people what that experience was like and, and the name of the song when, and the movie? when? Uh... Yeah, I wrote a song, I think, 22 years ago called Midnight to Her Soul. Wow. And um, that's when it wasn't cool, too. <laughs> and the words in the music are a little controversial, or were at that time, probably. Okay. I just, I'm still in the Bible Belt. I didn't realize that you wrote it 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the movie is contemporary. It was just released right. recently in the past right. couple the, of years. The movie was done by Ron Farnham, and it's uh, ho Hollywood and Vine. Nothing like the original Hollywood and Vine. Okay. He used that title. And um, I just sing the song at the, toward the end. And um, So this is an original composition mm -hmm. composed and sung by you. Right. Right. And you have all the ASCAP and ECI mm -hmm. and all the different right. accreditations. Okay. All right. Right. Um, so Midnight to Her Soul. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's, um, it sounds like a pro profound piece. It, it, it just came to me because what happens to me in writing music is that I'll go, okay, download. I know something's yeah, yeah, coming sure. in. And yeah. you go yeah. and you go start writing. Yeah. I was at a Burger King when I wrote it. <laughs> I was like, I don't, what? Eat, a burger king? I don't eat burgers, you know, but I was in the Burger King. It was just like, That's funny. Oh my gosh, I got it. So, right now, so you're right. You, grab, you find a piece of paper and you're just. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And uh, my daughter was, was young. Quite the inspirational place. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was, it was, and it was fun. It got to be fun. Yeah. Like we were, okay, what song's going to come through, you know? Jeez. Usually it was mainly words to get the. The melody, I'm more of a lyricist. Okay. To get the melody, I just sat down with the words. That's how I do it. I usually go words first, and then I put my melody. Too. Right. And you're, I've heard you play. You're a gifted pianist. So did you kind of knock this thing out uh, at the keyboards? Um, you know, once you, once you had the words. Well, to, yeah. I, I, to create the melody, you. I sat and kind of meditated. And okay. Through. I've taken other people's words and put music to them. That's another thing I do okay. sometimes. If they, um, or I can put words to people's music. Sure. I've done that a few times sure. too. My whole family were musicians. My dad was uh, soloed in church till he was like 95. He used to say, "Wow, oh, I got to go sing for the old people in the nursing home." <laughs> and he was 95. <laughs> That's so good. He was well preserved. He was, ran on the beach till he was about 96. I think. Wow. So, um, so you write this song cool. 22 years ago <clears throat> at Burger King, and uh, somehow you meet this gentleman, Ronald Farnham, and he produces this movie, Midnight. I met him Sorry. And, his wife and his wife at Milk Chest. Okay. And so he produces this indie film called Hollywood and Vine. Right. And your song, where you're singing, is is played when when is it toward when, the end toward the end, toward the end. Okay. yeah it's kind of a controversial movie too but okay but it was um yeah um let people see it to find out <laughs> that's great but i think he's a very gifted uh and right now he's working on some other other movies other projects yeah. yeah he does everything he edits it edits them and does the whole work well, all we, by himself we it's probably funny. ought to get him up here he wrote uh, a it, book too. He, he had the book under his arm, Hollywood and Vine, when I met him. Oh, okay. It was behind the Black Bear restaurant in Mount Shasta. And I'm walking my dog, and they're walking theirs. And just in a matter of 10 minutes, he goes, I got to have that song for my movie. <laughs> it was like, it was like meant to be. It's like we planned the whole thing before. But Mount Shasta, uh -huh. Mount Shasta is well, like that. Yes, it is. It's amazing. Yeah, which is, it's like Sedona. It's, it's, yeah, very much like Sedona. Things just happen in synchronicity, one after another. Um, he, you know, he would probably be appreciated and uh, well suited to 
fit in with the, if you will, community of people that are part of the Sedona Film Festival. Probably. Because there are a lot of very gifted mm -hmm. indie film directors and producers mm -hmm. that, that well, his, uh, his wife Tracy Moore also helps him edit mm, and okay. hold the cameras and do all this. Okay. So yeah, they That's they great. they're a gifted couple. So, so they're good people to know too. They're good friends. So um, well, that's that's a um, a notable accomplishment that you can you know tuck under your belt so to speak because not everybody can say i have a song that i've written that's in a movie <laughs> so that was one of my little goals you yeah know, you go, i'm oh, gonna okay. climb a mountain yeah. i'm going to do this and you have this list right before you die you're going to do all these things that was one of my goals uh, well, that's... <laughs> so i mark them off yeah you know? so i'm still working on my list i'm still i'm still doing them well, I, I am I am sure that as you get out there more and people get to experience the different the different gifts that you have and and your your skills and abilities as not only a singer and uh, someone who's communicating with the higher dimensions that uh, you'll positively affect a lot of lives and that's that's always a worthwhile pursuit. Well, helping. Yeah. Helping it whatever way you can. I, yeah. I, I always love that phrase. Service is the highest calling. Wow. Of course, we need to know the balance. Yeah, and so the boundaries. Serving for ourselves. Right. Serving for other people. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah I'm yeah. still working on that one. Okay. Um, so, Tolik for the Andromeda Council and Athena for soulsongwhisperer.com. If people would like out, sorry, if people would like to reach out to you, um, is the best way your email address? Is that the best way to find you through the website? Right. And your email? So what, what is your email address if people would like to reach out to you? Okay, musicalpeacemaker1 at gmail.com. It's okay. the number one, and it's peace, like peace and calm. So musicalpeacemaker and the number one yeah. at gmail.com. Right. Okay. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you very much for joining me. This has been very enlightening. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.